Hello and welcome to Module 5. So what's due? In Module 5, you have a 10-page position paper and all the guidelines are in the syllabi. Um, and then there's also a group discussion. Um, if you've kind of gotten a little bit behind on some of your other assignments, you really need to contact me. But it's real important for you to get in there and be part of the group discussion. So what does it mean to be a school leader? Basically, a lot of times we end up having to circle the wagons. And if you'll think back to our discussion on uh, that cyclic, reactive, data-driven, and proactive uh, by the time you circle the wagons, you, you're really in a reactive phase, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, looks like one of those wagons are on fire, um, and that's, that's what happens in schools. We, um, things can really get out of control in a hurry, and before you know it, you really have to circle your wagons. But that's all about being a leader and trying to figure out a better path. So we had the five myths of school improvement, um, I think back in module one. And we talked just for a moment about that. But myth one, we don't really know what works. Myth two, a single reform will move the needle. Myth three, one improvement is good as another. Myth four, Researchers agree about what's needed most. Myth five, educators resist accountability, really an understanding of what we are accountable for, and that is scores. So all those are myths. Um, I can't think of any one single educator where that would be true. Uh, or even myth four, researchers agree about what's needed most. Um, I think there's a collective body of research that points us in the right direction, but then there are those outliers. So we have to be really careful uh, when we look at research. So how can we add depth to the process of school improvement? And how are we, and how are we good listeners? How are we solution oriented? Um, it's okay if something falls apart. It's okay if you have to circle the wagons. What's not okay is that you don't pick up and learn from it and move forward. So what did you discover from your evaluation of individual school improvement plans or for those of you that actually developed that measurement document plan? Um, there was Hopefully, uh, it was insightful for you because when you dig deeper into what drives a plan, there should have been some type of needs assessment. Is there a discrepancy or gap between what is and what should be? A needs assessment is a systematic set of procedures used to determine needs, to examine the nature, the root causes, and to set priorities for action. So you can look at a needs assessment in those two ways. So what is, this is an example, 40% of third grade economically disadvantaged students are on track in ELA. What should be is you want 100% of third grade economically disadvantaged students on track in ELA. So the remaining 60% of third grade economically disadvantaged students must reach on track in ELA. That's, that's a need. That's, that's where you want your students to be. So a little more a deeper look, a comprehensive needs assessment, <clears throat> it takes into account all the parts of the whole, not just one targeted uh, aspect or group. The data analysis includes academic performance, staff, leadership, capacity, and professional development. It's really important to look at your school climate and culture. We talked a lot about that in Module 4, where it is okay um, if 
if things don't look right, it's how you deal with it. You cannot, you have to think back to David Rock's scarf model. You cannot uh, make people feel threatened. So parent and family engagement, and that, that's another issue in itself. Um, you know, it may be where you are, it may be rare that you have a lot of uh, parent and family involvement, um, but it, it's pretty much across the board. That's kind of hard to get. Um, COVID has brought on a different aspect to that for us, but uh, those are things that need to be included in data analysis. Um, your centerpiece of the needs assessment is the planning process. It should be conducted by a school team um, with lots of representation across the board. Uh, and then it reveals the priority needs in which the plan will focus, where resources will be allocated. Determining prioritized needs. Things to consider when determining um, the three, through, three to five needs to be addressed by the plan um, can be the magnitude of difference between what is and what should be. So think back to that example. We had 40% of third graders on track. We want 100%. So that leaves 60% that are not. Causes and contributing factors to the need. Uh, degree of difficulty in addressing the need. Consequences of not addressing the need immediately. Effects on other areas if the need is not met and the cost of implementing strategies to address the need. So determining prioritized needs. The planning team must clearly understand why the needs exist in order to address it. What factors contribute to need and what stands in the way of meeting that need? Priority needs should be things that can be re responsibly addressed within a coming year. So you cannot it needs to be measurable, it needs to be something that you can see right away. What about financial responsibilities? Before determining how to address priority needs, consider what has been done before. You have to identify the action addressed school improvement goals. Look to see how much the action costs to implement support. You have to analyze the results of the action using data and evidence. Determine if it would be worthwhile to continue or expand and determine if it needs to be eliminated or changed. So you have to be very careful. I think, and I'm going to say this here with, with humility, um, there are some teachers who uh, feel like that I can get rid of everything I've had in my classroom and somebody's going to bring me in all new stuff. Then you've got teachers who know that's not the way it is and they hoard up everything. Um, I was pretty much a, a hoarder because when I started, I had to uh, clean out, when I started my career in teaching, I had to clean out a closet, a janitor's closet, and that's where I was at. I had nothing. Um, so it, it's real important that if you have a plan about where you want to go, then then your monies that you have available to you can be spent a, a lot more efficiently. Goal strategies and action steps. The goals are based on what should be. They should be smart. They should break down the needs into smaller chunks. Um, it's always good to aim high, but you don't want to set yourself up for failure. Um, so we know, so we can think back to that, uh, the need that we want those 60% of those students in third grade ELA to be on track, but it's not realistic to know that when we make our actual goal that we're going to say that 100% of our kids who are economically disadvantaged are going to be on track. We know that that's not going to work. So we have to set a goal. We're going to aim high. So we can improve that by 15%, 20%. We want to add to it and, and make it where we can feel successful while still understanding that we're trying to get to that 100%. Strategies 
are the solutions that the planning team believes will be addressed. Um, the need represents the gap, again, between what is and what should be. And strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve that goal. It's like your game plan, your master plan. Uh, it's all those X's and O's from the football coach. So goal alignment, in order to align the LEA and school plans, you inherit goals and strategies from the LEA, and that is your leadership. And the school can extend the goals and strategies uh, and then connect those to school specific needs. Um, goals and strategies can be marked non-applicable, just depending. But the point here is that it has to be aligned. So the action steps <clears throat> are the activities that must take place in order to implement those strategies and achieve goals. There has to be a verb in the plan. It needs to be concrete, it needs to cause change, and it has to be measured. So it has to be a measurable action step with a verb that lets you know that you are moving toward your goals. They require description that, dis that supports the strategy. Um, is the is the going is it going to help achieve the goal if not can it be altered there has to be a benchmark indicator you know how do we know we've been successful um, there has to be someone responsible who's going to be held accountable for the completion of the action step and then there has to be an uh, estimated completion date so if you if you pause here a moment and think you do this in your classroom. You know where you need to be. You work toward doing that. You set incremental goals. You're the one responsible. And then you have you have a time frame, whether it's a, a week unit, um, a six week unit, a nine week unit. You have you have that, you work inside those perimeters. A school action plan or a school uh, improvement plan works the same way and then you can even relate that even out to a district plan which is a larger umbrella that it all works the same way so this is the school plan review uh, rubric that was in module four um, this this one actually came from um, the state of Tennessee as we are um, looking at our school improvement plans we go back does it need improvement does it meet expectations does it exceed expectations and this is the component for the school planning team so again that's a very important piece to what is going on you can't do it alone so how does school improvement relate to climate and culture? What is at the heart of the work? Again, I want to refer you back to David Rock's SCARF model. It's all that perception, how you make other people feel, uh, how you go about embracing where they are and leading them to feel better about what they're doing. Um, so. What is at the heart of the work? You know, we can be uh, the ugly bee, kaboom, or we can work together to hit that nail on the head. There is, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember which module I put it in, uh, maybe two, module two, but there's an article, The Price of Incivility. Uh, perhaps it's in module four, but how does rudeness affect you how do you combat incivility? And there's several questions there, but I hope you, uh, and, I, and I wanted to pause here as well. I hope you take just a few minutes to, to download that on your, on your device and read it. Uh, it's, it's pretty telling. Um, again, it's all about that working environment. We can't improve things by ourselves. We absolutely cannot. We have to work together as a team and how we treat each other is so important.
Um, there's also another article, and I and I think I I think those are in module four, uh, building collective leadership, and it does talk about the power of teamwork and the power of working together, and the power of pulling your wagon all in the same direction. So that is a really good another good article that I wanted to call your attention to. And then, what about doing the work? What's the data that makes it purposeful or meaningful? Who really cares about the data? What does data really mean? And then what types of data will help you move your class, your school, your system, the state, your community? So you have to look at all those pieces. And I'm going to go back to Dr. Burkhart's um, measurement Venn diagram uh, where everything intersects. It's, it's about the demographics. It's about the perceptions. It's about the, the school processes. And then, of course, it's about the school learning. But everything is at the heart um, of, of what can drive your school to be better. Uh, it allows the prediction of actions, processes, programs, what best meets the needs of all the learners in your school. So why intersect data categories? Um, it replaces hunches and hypotheses with facts. For example, you can say, you could say, well, our absentee rate is just out the roof. So is it? Okay, but where is it? And is there something we're doing about it? Identify the root cause of problems, not just the symptoms. Address needs and target resources to address them. You can set goals and keep track of whatever they are being accomplished. Track the impact of staff development efforts. So all those things help um, the data categories as they intersect and work with each other. So pulling the data all together, why and how is it powerful for students, teachers, and schools to know data? Well, I'm going to go back to this. You, you can generalize and you can make assumptions. Um, you can sit with a teacher that says, oh, I know my students. But when you ask them specific questions about they're not reading well, why are they not reading well? Think back to Jack, who was in fifth grade. Um, he'd gotten all the way up to fifth grade and he was not phonemically or phonetically sound. Um, he didn't hear vowel sounds. So you can say you, you know your kids, okay, I know they're not reading well, but you have to ask those hard questions. Why? It has to be replaced with facts. So why, why are our improvement efforts here today and gone tomorrow? Uh, why do improvement efforts seem to fade out and die? For one reason, I don't think in some cases we understand what we're trying to improve. Um, we have to make sure that what we're doing is sustainable. Um, and we don't want to just keep on chasing uh, rainbows and unicorns because it looks good or somebody else was doing it and we think, oh, well, I'm going to try that. And you really, it really has to be purposeful. You're, you have to align your assessments to your purpose. Uh, the purpose needs to be clear. Uh, what am I doing it for? What's it going to help? All those things come together to really help uh, move you forward. So digging deeper into sustainable improvement. Um, I'm going to close out this course and this module. I'm going to read you a little book. Um, that kind of, it, it really, I think, culminates what we do and, and what, we, what we stand for and where, what we really need to think about when we're working with our, our cohorts at school when we're um, becoming a, a leader. Sam and Dave Dig a Hole. It's by Mac Barnett and illustrated by John Classen. On Monday, Sam and Dave dug a hole. 
When should we stop digging, asked Sam. We are on a mission, said Dave. We won't stop digging until we find something spectacular. The hole got so deep that their heads were underground, but they still had not found anything spectacular. We need to keep digging, said Dave. So they kept digging. Looks like the dog is a little more in tune there. Then they took a break. Dave drank chocolate milk out of a canteen. Sam ate animal cookies he had wrapped into their grandfather's kerchief. Maybe, said Dave, the problem is that we are digging straight down. Yes, said Sam, that could be the problem. I think we should dig in another direction, said Dave. Yes, said Sam, that is a very good idea. I have a new idea, said Dave. Let's split up. Really? said Sam. Just for a little while, said Dave. It will help our chances. So, oh my goodness, they're digging all around. That's something special. So Dave went one way and Sam went another. But they did not find anything spectacular. Maybe we should go back to digging straight down, said Dave. Yes, said Sam, that is a good idea. Sam and Dave ran out of chocolate milk, but they kept digging. They shared the last animal cookie, but they kept digging. After a while, Sam sat down. Davy said, I am tired. I cannot dig anymore. I am tired too, said Dave. We should take a rest. Sam and Dave fell asleep. Then Sam and Dave were falling. Sam and Dave fell down, down, until they landed in the soft dirt. Well, said Sam. Well, said Dave. That was pretty spectacular. And they went inside for chocolate milk and animal cookies. So from that, it's just a child's way of bringing things around. Um, when, when the tough, when it got going tough, they were digging all around that thing that they were looking for or what they were hoping to find. Um, they didn't pay any attention to their dog who was part of the team. They split up. Um, then they just kind of fell out of it. It was, it was over. So it's real important to stay the course um, and think about Sam and Dave dig a hole the next time that, that people aren't paying attention to each other. So um, just wanted to share this little book with you. I think it really does speak volumes to us in the light of um, thinking about how to improve schools, how to use data, how to use each other collaboratively. And when we look further, um, let's think about the gradual release of responsibility and its relationship to school improvement. How can we use the gradual release of responsibility model to meet the needs of school improvement? Um, in the classroom, it works the same way. I do, we do, then the whole class has guided instruction. Then it's the student's responsibility, um, that collaboration and independent practice. So we do, you do together, you do on your own. And it's all about empowering uh, others to do what they need to do. Other classroom connections is you, you have to have those objectives. So you have to have those purpose. You have to have that SMART goal you have to have all those things aligned. And it, it is the difference between failure and success for sure. So finally, the most important part is that 
everything we do is for our children. And that is the end of Module 5.